Hello, and welcome to Fostering Connections with the Natural World, a Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Amanda Beck, a research associate with the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia. Through this series, we will hear from practitioners and researchers who are creating healthier communities, healthier landscapes, and healthier people through increased connections with nature. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities. In the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched, with partner cities spanning the globe from San Francisco, California, Wellington, New Zealand, and Singapore. This series is one way the Biophilic Cities Project aims to help share knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and individuals around the world who are championing biophilic design. To see the full schedule of topics and to register for an upcoming webinar, please visit our website at www.biophiliccities.org backslash registration. Today, we will hear from Professor Robin Moore who is a professor of landscape architecture at North Carolina State University and is the director of the Natural Learning Initiative. Moore is an international author, authority, excuse me, an international authority on the design of children's play and learning environments, research about user needs, and participatory public open space design. She is active as a design consultant for many children's projects, such as the Friends Club Adventure Play Park in New South Wales, Australia, and the new Explore Children's Facility at the Brookfield Zoo. In addition to all of these things, he has also authored and co-authored several articles and books, including the title Natural Learning. Professor Moore will speak for 30 minutes to be followed by questions from the audience. So I will go ahead and let Professor Moore take it away. OK, very good. <laughs> so uh, thank you, uh, Amanda, and uh, thank you for this invitation. I'm indeed honored, and, and um, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, this afternoon. So um, we're going to jump straight in here. Um, so the presentation will uh, cover these uh, various topics, a little bit about what NLI is, who I am, what we do, a bit of the backstory that led up to the foundation of NLI, um, and really a focus on the demonstration action research sites that we've created over the years, um, and especially a focus on early childhood system change here in North Carolina, and a mention of the Nature Care and Learning Places National Guidelines, and then leaving time at the end for our Q&A. So the um, Natural Learning Initiative was founded on the first day of 2000 <laughs> with the mission of creating environments for healthy human development in the healthy biosphere for generations to come. Just a uh, small ambition there. But uh, down to practical business, we uh, deliver uh, through design assistance to communities, mainly in North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina State is a land grant university. Uh, we're, we're here because we want to conduct interdisciplinary action research. We do a great deal of professional development with a variety of different professions, designers, of course, but also many educational groups. And we try to disseminate the information that we generate through our, mainly through our website. So over the years, we have worked with uh, more than 150 childcare centers. Uh, around 30 schools, uh, uh, around 17 parks, and then we work a lot in this area of non-formal education uh, with institutions that include zoos and nature centers, environmental education centers, uh, et cetera, a range of different places where children and families uh, spend their time. Our professional development uh, is focused on two main events each year, the Design Institute, which happens in the fall, and Growing in Place, which happens in the spring, as well as many, many other kinds of uh, events that we uh, do as part of the projects that we're working on. This is our website. Uh, we try to keep it up to date. There's a lot of information there, um, uh, www.naturallearning.org and we invite you to take a look. So um, we follow, I would say, in a very general sense, a socio-ecological model focused on the built environment. So as you probably know, it has 
many different levels. It was developed by Yuri Bronfenbrenner. I've worked with it for decades. Um, and mainly, we're working right down at the bottom there where the red star is. So in the microsystem, the uh, settings that are, are engaged with children by children and families in everyday life. So it's all about the everyday environment that's lived in and used by children and families. So if you go back a bit, um, how did this start? Uh, I, my background uh, in formal education is architecture, five degree in architecture, and studying regional planning. And as Amanda said, I basically worked in landscape architecture my whole career, although I don't have a qualification there. That's my adopted profession. So uh, as a graduate student at MIT, I worked with Kevin Lynch and Donald Appleyard mainly, and it was a great time to be there in the mid-60s. Uh, it was post-urban renewal and the beginning of the advocacy planning uh, era. And I kind of got into this idea of how can we design cities to better support healthy, equitable uh, human development. So uh, for my graduate work, I worked in a, a Boston uh, public housing community over many, many months, uh, constructing a kind of experimental play environment which I uh, for which I had to develop some measurement tools because there was nothing around at that time at all. And so I started to work with observational um, approaches, uh, documenting children's behavior, trying to figure out how the behavior and the environment were, were interlinked. And um, that has continued really into this day. So even that early work, um, you graduate students, I would encourage you to find every which way to publish your work. Um, as soon as you have something worth saying to the world. And I was, I've been very fortunate in those opportunities over many years. Um, that first project also set me thinking about the idea of incremental development, of how you would manage this kind of space as an ongoing enterprise, not something that parachutes down one day and then is just maintained day to day as a status quo, but something that's living and vital in the community. So from MIT, I returned to England and uh, worked with a very interesting firm that was just starting up called Land Use Consultants. Uh, at that time, very much involved in large-scale land uh, restoration in the old industrial cities of England. And I got very excited by this work and worked mainly in Stoke-on-Trent, which is pretty much in the center of England. Um, getting rid of big mounds of coal waste and putting them into large holes where uh, clay had been mined. <laughs> and the former railheads being converted into greenways. So it was a really interesting um, experience of converting this very close to home landscape because the residential areas grew up around the mines. So it was very interwoven. We got our first 10 acre uh, site on the ground to demonstrate to the city fathers that this was a viable prospect uh, using uh, central government funding and developing very um, modest kinds of landscape renovation treatments, spending some money on large trees, but most of it going into little tiny forest uh, plantings. So um, a few years ago, uh, I went back to observe what had happened. And this is what it uh, looked like after 40 years of growth. So, very, very exciting to see the uh, way in which uh, nature can take out the landscape, how resilient it is with a little help uh, from its human friends. And great to see how the community are using these uh, green resources right in the center of the city. Um, just amazing. Just uh, So um, then uh, from there to UC Berkeley, Landscape Architect Department, same question in mind. So now we're in the 70s, and the Stockholm Conference is about to happen. Only One Earth was just published, so we're on to a more of an environmental track here, uh, which wasn't the case back in Boston, as you probably observed. So taking the Boston lessons, I wanted to try to test that kind of concept now in an elementary school setting. So this uh, project at Washington School in the center of town uh, occupied me for about 10 years. So we, after about seven years, this is what it looked like. And as you can see, pretty impressive uh, uh, increase in species from um, more or less monoculture of asphalt. And 
also documenting again how the children were interacting with this, and then in the case of it being a school, how it was used and motivating children to learn by direct engagement with this living landscape it was very powerful. Uh, gardening was also something that we explored, and we could see how easy it was to actually get this off the ground and the easiest thing for teachers to work with. We also ran programs during the summer to explore this idea of animation and play work, play leadership, very creative work with children in this kind of landscape. So uh, through that experience, I began to piece together the um, relationship between play and learning, which is they're very close, and then how that comes into a kind of educational con continuum, indoors, outdoors, uh, and uh, I guess I would say the diversity of landscape is a key driver in all of this. Uh, we started to develop the tools that I had uh, began to scratch around with in Boston, um, develop a systematic behavior mapping uh, protocol, which we use to this day, to, write, to try to figure out how the environment was actually used. So, so uh, developing that kind of um, from those data, which was very good data, uh, uh, an idea of how the ecosystem is a multi-level um, system, going from zones to settings to the affordance attributes of each of the settings. Started then to develop some metrics that will be standard ways of evaluating these kinds of um, spaces in terms of proportion of use to proportion of space and many other kinds of metrics you can develop using behavior mapping. Um, out of that work came this idea of uh, standard behavior setting or activity setting um, set, which now we've worked with for many years and becomes a shared uh, language between designer and um, client and educators. We also looked at perception and memory of this space. Very interesting to see the difference. So out of that work, uh, three books are published, uh, Natural Learning being the thing that drove the development of the Natural Learning Initiative here in NC State, so back at NC State. Um, but during the course of that school ground project, I was also investigating children's use at the neighborhood scale, uh, both in the San Francisco Bay Area and in England. Um, don't have time to go into this very much, but in the San Francisco Bay is essentially looking at the urbanization transit from uh, the center of San Francisco through developed suburbs different, of different kinds, as you can see there, Berkeley, um, Walnut Creek, Concord, and then out to a rural town in the Napa Valley. Very interesting work. And then in England, uh, three uh, cities that I already had very good uh, contact with, including Stoke-on-Trent. So the British work got published, um, Stoke-on-Trent being an old city, London being a big city, Stevenage being a new city. So I'm very much interested in different patterns of urbanization and how they influence the affordances and the kinds of settings that children and farmers can explore day to day uh, using uh, a great deal of um, the, the mental mapping uh, approach that Kevin Lynch developed originally for cities. Very useful uh, uh, tool to work with children, as you can see here. So going out with kids, exploring the neighborhood, seeing how uh, what the street environment uh, means to them. So streets continue to be a major uh, interest of, uh, of us at, in the, at NLI. And so from that work, um, began to build up a sense of the neighborhood as an ecosystem for children and families, uh, where the home base is obviously critically important, but the spaces around the home are also very important, so-called habitual range, the, the spaces that children can use every day. And then maybe at weekends, with more time available, they have a frequented range of less used spaces, and then um, maybe if there's greenways and safe streets and that kind of thing, um, they can go further afield to their occasional spaces or occasional range. Um, but there's many reasons why even older children stay close to home, because they don't have much time and also parental constraints. So um, range development has breadth and depth uh, according to all of these different conditions that you see here, especially parental permission, which has become much more important these days. But 
we see good examples of how different settings in the city afford different types of activities for children, just the environment as it's given to them. Um, all of that was published in Charter's Domain many years ago. Um, so much more recently, um, one of my uh, PhD students took this kind of way of thinking of neighborhood, about neighborhoods to Dhaka in, Bang in Bangladesh, working directly with children, beautiful study, using Google tools in real time with children to identify their neighborhoods and where they went and what they did and what the constraints were. Very nice piece of work. And also going out with the students. So that was recently published in Environment and Behavior. <coughs> So uh, one of the issues that uh, we still uh, hope to crack here is um, looking at residential form and density from this point of view. As you may know, there has not been much uh, research on housing in recent years. And, and uh, meanwhile, the housing forms have evolved. Um, so it's all about building footprints, the form of housing, the kind of open space distribution at different levels of density. These are very much things that we're working on right now. And of course, a lot has to do with how you manage the car, where it's parked on the ground, underneath the buildings. People space versus parking space is what it's all about. So uh, bringing all this together uh, at this point in time uh, is the idea of One Health, uh, which has been put forward by the World Health Organization 2005. Uh, really talking about the uh, integrated ecosystem of humankind, animals, and the biosphere. So we're sort of working with that idea. Um, the, uh, during these last several years, the uh, scientific uh, grounding for all of this, I think, has improved magnificently. Um, this is a short selection of the scientific literature that's out there um, that's listed on our website. Um, interesting things are going on all the time. Uh, Singapore has a national campaign uh, to reduce the risk of myopia by getting kids outdoors. Good science to support that. Most recently, we had the pleasure of visiting uh, the lab at Chiba University, myself and colleague Lola Kosko, um, using very similar technology to, I think, what uh, Penny Roe talked about um, in one of your earlier presentations. So monitoring uh, frontal cortex behavior. And this is Nilda on the bottom left here sniffing on rose, the essence of roses. And you can see her brain just taking off really rapidly. So this is uh, really interesting work. Um, these guys also go out into the forest and, and uh, do the same kind of thing while this monitoring. So, um, we think we need to start working with very young children. Uh, human evolution has been almost 100% in the natural environment. Um, so we need to kind of tune into the genetic endowment of young children. And we see that as a way of um, guiding a sustainable culture over the long haul. So the sustainability strategy for us, the kind of little big approach, would be working with young, young children, continuing to work with them. Um, through the later years and creating compelling nature places to pull kids and caregivers out of doors. So um, it's all about introducing uh, children to, sorry, skip that really fast, introducing children to uh, plants early in life, using plants as an interactive medium. It's all about engaging with plants. Just a, a fun example here of kings and queens and Rosa Banks here. <laughs> um, so what's happened here in North Carolina is uh, really exciting. Uh, back in 2007, in the play in the child care center system, um, they changed the word playground to outdoor learning environment. So that kind of empowered us to go along with this kind of idea. So we started a project called Preventing Obesity by Design, very deliberately in the, health, in the public health domain. And that's now been going seven years and has grown enormously. So we've um, worked with many child care centers directly. We have about 60 demonstration sites on the ground across the state. Um, this is what it looks like in North Carolina, 4,800 licensed child care centers. So it's an enormous system, um, very much tied into the community college uh, system. We have 58 community colleges here in the state. That's where the early childhood teachers get educated. And so we're working to bring that whole system together. 
uh, as we say, to influence 4,800 points of light on the ground. There's many pockets of poverty in North Carolina, actually great regions of poverty, so it's very highly varied. So if you look at those 4,800 points of light, and if you say, well, it's the average of 10,000 square feet per outdoor learning environment, that's about 1,000 acres in the state to be restored and to be made into a decent environment for children. As you would see here, this is a very urban center in Chapel Hill. Um, year zero, pretty bland, uh, basic environment for kids, add some trees. And before you know it, two years later, it's a very, very different kind of experience. And of course, kids are going to spend more time outside, and teachers are going to be more comfortable being there. So a lot of our research work is actually woven into these projects as, as very careful evaluation. We've managed to gather enough scientific data to uh, be fairly successful in publication in the literature. So we're happy about that. Um, we're using behavior mapping still, as you saw earlier, um, to gauge the level of physical activity. We've got a pretty good handle on, some, on how some of these systems work. Um, the, the pathways in particular, we can demonstrate how this is a critical setting in childcare centers, that if you have a good looping um, uh, pathway, you can raise the level of physical activity more than 20%, really good result. We've uh, started to work a, a lot with gardening, so it's hands in the dirt, direct experience of gardening, so that Kids know the difference between a cucumber and a zucchini, and the parents, as has happened, won't try to fry a cucumber when they get home. <laughs> um, this uh, publication just came out in the fall, uh, a toolkit, which is uh, essentially part of our training system for uh, childcare uh, educators. Um, so we've um, got a new program going here that will tell you uh, we're about to publish this system. Don't have the details yet, but. Um, one of the main things is the second volume, the best practice indicators. So we have a way of measuring um, the uh, progressive increase in quality of the outdoor learning environment in childcare centers. So a few other projects um, in the realm of community parks. We have a demonstration site here in Cary, North Carolina. That we've worked with for many years. Kids were involved in in its design. It's now a mature site, um, more than 10 years old, a really good example of uh, in, in integrating a living environment in a manufactured play environment. So it's really not a playground. It's kind of a family recreation space. And people drive all the way across the county to get to it. It's very, very successful. Again, we've done some behavior mapping. We know kind of how those settings work. That's already been published. Um, we've continued that research in Durham, North Carolina, an interdisciplinary team here at NC State. We've also published on that. And when you start to investigate some of these sites, uh, this is a good example, 46 acres, but 70% of the use happens in 2% of the park area because that's the developed spot. So it raises interesting management issues. Um, so that study has been published in in uh, one of the open space publications out of the University of uh, Edinburgh. So from the park uh, research, we've developed a, a list of um, recommendations and guidelines for uh, decision makers, including designers and, and planners. So uh, to another park, uh, perhaps the most uh, interesting, certainly the most ambitious uh, in Manhattan, working with a wonderful group in Michael Van Valkenburg's office to develop Teardrop Park, which has a, as you see here, a very active southern end and a more pastoral northern end. Um, this is what it looks like. It's uh, the idea of the park as the playground for all people. Um, the only space that's somewhat segregated is the very, very young children that you see in the top left there. Otherwise, it's free form for everybody, including teenagers, um, or adolescents, and that was the behavior map that we did um, a, a couple of years ago. Um, sorry, skip that rather fast. Um, so in the south end, you see that's much more heav heavily um, used than the, than the northern end, which is meant to be more pastoral. So we can 
say to the designer um, that the concept really works. Um, we have a good spread of use by different age groups uh, in the analysis of the behavior settings. And here's the pastoral end and the beautiful um, uh, rock wall artwork that separates the two areas. And in the background there, you see the uh, surface water detention pond, which is actually a little mini woodland where all the uh, fairies and elves live. So joking aside, um, that site has um, supported an amazing amount of play programming from the Battery Park City um, Park Conservancy. So just to finish up, um, the most recent publication is the Nature Play and Learning uh, Places sponsored by the U.S. Forest Service and uh, represents uh, three, one of three different publications and work that we've done with the National Wildlife Federation, great partnership of many years. Um, we've also put out a publication about Nature Play at Home and also about play work in the forest, the Nature Play Corps. Again, information is on our website. On that, on those projects. So the guidelines contain seven chapters, which take the reader through the why and wherefore of nature play, uh, where they should be located, why they're important in terms of learning and education, and um, how they can be designed and managed. Um, uh, chapter six, there, uh, managing risks, risks and benefits, very important. Um, my colleague in National Wildlife Federation is a lawyer, so it's a very strong chapter. We also worked with a national committee of experts, so it's a very solid um, document here. And then lastly, how to engage with the community in creating these kinds of spaces. So the document includes uh, 11 case uh, studies from around the country. I'm just going to show a couple of them. Um, here is a really good example of an existing park which has bathrooms and parking and a nice playground, but but beyond the playground, a little remnant woodland, which is managed for nature play very successfully. Very low key, a few hundred dollars to clear some trails, feed it with some logs and um, branches of trees and so forth, and off you go. And there's a drainage ditch there. The parents are on board with this. It's used by the local elementary school for educational purposes. A much more uh, ambitious project is at the Cincinnati Nature Center. Um, this is a little bit out of town, but would be, uh, in our mind, something that you could do in an urban park, um, much more expensive. Uh, we trained the landscape architects uh, who got the job here. As you can see, it's attracting quite a range of children. Parents can overlook the site. It's, uh, it's fenced in, so parents really appreciate that. They let the children roam free. So that they can't get into trouble. Um, very creative landscape, has a stream recycling through it. Um, so that raises the question of uh, green infrastructure, which I have to say we use the British view of this, uh, which is very broad, um, all of the green stuff in the city. How can we make that green infrastructure accessible and appropriate to use by children and families? Since kids are not out alone, usually they're typically in the company of adults, so we have to make those spaces um, attractive to all ages, in fact, uh, intergenerational. So the last project is at uh, a local uh, children's museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, where there was a piece of unused land on the north side of the museum, and the former director wanted to really create uh, an edible schoolyard, in other words, an educational space for um, educational programs for families and children. Um, and it's right downtown, that's the point here. Uh, very accessible to a wide range of populations. There's uh, public housing just down the street. The children get engaged, it's based on permaculture principles, what it looks like. I think it's a really good model. Um, chickens, rabbits, hands-on gardening. Kids set up a farmer's market in the summer sell the produce to their parents, make some money, do cooking. There's a fully fledged kitchen adjacent that was there before, so a very a great benefit from that. So the, the children are involved in cooking and eating together. It's all about seed to Tommy. So um, that's the end of the presentation. I'd be very happy to take uh, questions uh, that you might have.
it's all about helping children to grow up to love the planet, to vote for the planet, to pay their taxes for the planet, and generally help the uh, Earth be successful as long as you can see into the infinite future. Thank you, Professor Moore. Um, just a few questions. What ways have the children you've worked with and worked for help expand your ideas and the way you design? Um, have they opened your eyes to new ways to design play spaces? Of course. <laughs> so uh, all of our work is community-based. Um, I'm sure you got the, the impression of that as I, as I spoke. I didn't really go into much detail there. But all of our work is community-based. It's um, all about getting stakeholders uh, involved, and of course, including children. So, um, in even in our early childhood work, we uh, engage children in the process. And of course, in projects like uh, parks, or the last project I, I showed, um, children are always part of it. So. As any designer knows, children are always going to come up with um, ideas that you would never think of. So that's that's being the way to go from the from the very beginning. But children were very involved already in that project in Boston, as well as the families, mothers in particular. So I guess the interesting thing about this is that children, as you stated in your presentation, are often accompanied when they are out of doors. Um, and so they might be excited about something, but we still often need to convince parents. So I'm curious, how has child psychology research increased on the, the positive effects of these sort of natural play areas? And does NLI work in any way to make sure such research is available to the public who may not have access to academic journals or databases? Well, um, great question. Um, so we're trying to cover the waterfront here. <laughs> so um, when NLI was founded, we really dedicated uh, ourselves to get published in the scientific literature, in the in the high grade journals. Right. So we've been fairly successful there. Um, we continue to publish in other kinds of ways, um, and certainly um, speaking of my own philosophy of research, it's very much on the action research um, level. So um, we are also gathering information which is published in, in softer sources and more directly accessible uh, to the lay public and to other professions that are not going to delve into um, the science journals. So a lot of what we do is about um, science, uh, translating the science. Um, so that's a whole field, I think, that is is growing rapidly and um, is really, really important. Uh, you mentioned psychology. So of course, our work is in the general field of environmental psychology. So that's our main colleagues. Um, uh, through the Environmental Design Association would be the main meeting ground, uh, I think, of our field, where we're trying to connect attributes of the built environment to behavior and to predict what kinds of attributes or settings or mixes of affordances would have a predictable outcome in terms of behavior. So that a lot of our work has been in the field of public health, as, as you surely um, realize. But uh, at this point in time, we're beginning to broaden back again to other attributes of child development, especially uh, attention functioning, um, uh, cognitive uh, attributes that we can measure through behavior mapping, um, the educational work in, that we've been doing in zoos. I didn't mention that. Um, but we have uh, quite uh, a number of studies where we can uh, demonstrate how different kinds of settings in the zoo environment will produce different types of learning behavior uh, among children according to the age. Is there an ideal yeah. balance uh, between time spent inside the classroom and time spent outside playing? Um, so um, 
it's a typical educational program, whether it's childcare center or schools, is going to be mainly indoors. And so our whole effort here is to make the outdoor environment equivalent in its educational power or its interest to children uh, to the indoor environment so uh, that you can create a much more balanced uh, mix of time indoors and outdoors. So it's always an indoor-outdoor relationship. Um, but if the outdoor environment does not afford the kinds of things that teachers need to work with, teachers and kids are not going to go out. So childcare centers may have a mandated amount of time outdoors, perhaps 45 minutes or an hour uh, in an eight or nine hour day, which is obviously not enough. So we've been very successful in um, changing that paradigm so that our behavior mapping and surveys and childcare centers demonstrate the effect of improving the quality of the outdoor environment so that children are spending two or three hours. In fact, some centers even more than that outdoors. Um, in school environments, in public school environments, it's much tougher to break this new paradigm of no child left behind, <laughs> which some states is cha are changing to no child left inside, right? You may be aware of that, but states are developing environmental um, uh, literacy plans which are related to legislation which is stuck in Congress, probably won't go anywhere under this administration. Um, but, you know, the thought is there. There is, uh, of course, a growing movement across the country uh, regarding children and nature. Um, which I think anybody working in the field has got aware of. That started with which Reed's book, Last Child in the Woods. So that that um, that movement is gaining in strength and having uh, more and more influence um, on the places where kids uh, live and the spaces they use on a daily basis. Have the parks that you've worked on seen any crime reductions, especially in inner city areas? I wish I had data on that. <laughs> I don't. Um, so uh, that's a great question to which we don't have much of an answer, but I will say that the park research that I briefly alluded to in Durham, North Carolina, I think we have three articles now in the scientific literature. Um, one of the key attributes that we looked at in the GIS um, aspect of the research was crime data. We had very good crime data. Um, Bill Smith, who's a sociologist, um, is an expert on, on urban crime. And um, so we have some pretty nice findings there, but that's not as a result of any change happening to the environment. So you know, your question is a little bit different. Um, to be honest, we have not worked uh, in um, very impacted urban environments like you would find in Chicago or any of the larger cities. Um, we have not had the opportunity to do that. We would love to, but it just hasn't come up. Oops. Do the books you've listed talk about how to get city governments and local communities excited and engaged with designing one of these OLEs? But also, uh, do you have any suggestions for places where people could find funding so they could do their own OLE in their community? Um, so the term OLE um, or OLE or outdoor learning environment is primarily um, applied to childcare centers um, because it's part of the North Carolina rules for licensing of, of childcare centers. We sometimes use the term for other educational environments, and it is uh, it is getting traction, <laughs> I have to say. Um, so um, it does give this more serious uh, cachet to the outdoor space, but we would not want it to be seen as an instructional space, right? It's a playful space where, where kids learn by being together, interacting with a rich environment. That's the whole idea. Um, so um, how do you... How do you, um, so if you look at childcare centers, um, typically they are um, licensed at state level 
and uh, typically through the State Department of Child Development or sometimes through a health agency. There's various ways in which they are administered. So those are the folks that you would want to influence. And um, that's beginning to happen. Um, Texas and South Carolina have picked up on the pod approach and are running with it. And we're working with them. Um, they're making great strides, I have to say, um, using the, the methodology that we've developed and being able to demonstrate it on the ground. Um, our funding is, uh, I would say, still the main source of funding is from the health sector. So check out your local um, health um, agencies, hospitals. Um, we've had very good support in North Carolina from the Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina Foundation. So other states have that kind of setup where there's foundation money that comes from the system. Um, because health is a very demonstrable um, outcome of this kind of work, and it's a huge issue. I didn't go into that today, really, but we will know about it, right? That uh, kids, even very young kids, are getting overweight and even obese, and that carries through into um, teenagehood and adulthood and has all these terrible uh, health issues attached to it, not to mention the cost of treating. So health is the still a trump card here. I'm just curious. Yes. I have several nieces who live in a more northern area. What sort of design techniques exist for creating natural play spaces in cold climates that can be used during winter months? Well, there's a nice question. Um, so some years ago, we worked with um, the, it's a combined, well, it's a research center that's on the Wellesley College in, in Wellesley, Massachusetts. Um, it's a small program, but it's very well developed. And um, while they really demonstrated um, how to be outdoors year round, <laughs> Uh, and kids love the snow there, so it's all about clothing. Um, the, the methodology is the same. Uh, it's still uh, working with the kids and the staff and stakeholders, um, creating a compelling design that's going to attract money, in that case, from the alumni of um, this uh, research center that is the Child Study Center at Wellesley. Um, so I think it's 90 years old, so they had lots of adults who could ask the money. And anyway, so um, kids are out there in sheltered corners, uh, in a snowstorm, <laughs> very instructive to us, playing with Tonka toys in the snow, et cetera. So I think it's a lot to do with the attitude to, to weather and having the right clothing. Uh, we can learn a lot from Sweden in this regard. Um, and it's interesting across the different regions how uh, how it works, you know. So here in North Carolina, oh, it's just a little bit chilly. I'm not going to go outside. It's just sprinkling with rain. I'm not going to go outside. Um, so it's it's very relative. Uh, we found. Um, so uh, I think uh, we need to work more with the architecture of the center. And um, there's not that many examples of childcare centers that have really appropriate um, indoor spaces that are like using glazed areas so you're growing plants year round so you can garden year round indoors in a, in a kind of um, glass house um, uh, aspect of the architecture. We're, we're working on that. We're trying to get good examples. Wellesley College does have a greenhouse. They use it year round um, and uh, it's very successful. So it, it's, I would say, a lot to think about architecture and microclimate. Microclimate is a big one because you can you can have a 10 or 15 year uh, excuse me degree difference from one place to another according to you know if the sun's out in a, in a cold climate not in the middle of the winter probably but at either side of the winter. So kids are increasingly attached to electronic devices these days. Um, what sort of techniques? are being used to get them outdoors more and away from their iPhones and computers? 
Well, I'd say there's two things going on. There's some serious thinking about how to um, integrate electronics into the outdoor environment. And as you know, the technology is changing dramatically with wearable devices that are getting smaller and smaller and less and less obtrusive. Um, in fact, there's a workshop next week that's part of the um, Children and Nature Network conference in Austin uh, devoted to that topic, which we are going to attend and learn from. Um, and I think the other uh, strategy which we are pushing very hard is that the outdoor environment has to be compelling enough to drag kids away from those devices, to get them outdoors. And what we find, especially with young children, um, that works. You know, kids are still fascinated with nature. It's a very social environment. They can be with their friends, messing around, playing around, um, having fun. Uh, that's what it's all about. But it has to be rich. It has to be engaging. It has to have animal life in it. It has to be a real ecosystem. Because kids are fascinated by animals. And I'm talking about very small ones, like I showed the grasshopper, butterflies, ants, worms, all of that stuff. Um, up through the elementary years, and then it begins to be a learning environment, a serious, seriously connected to the classroom. But some children that have that kind of concrete thinking um, approach to learning are going to excel with that kind of environment. So it's, it's a complex um, situation here. But I, I'm very hopeful that we can create a balance. You know, we, we're not going to get rid of it of the new digital digital age, which is fantastic, and there's so many potentials attached to it, but we need to also um, find ways to connect it to a living environment that we all depend on. Well, thank you, Professor Moore, for joining us today. Um, your evidence-based research on the interrelation between human, animal, and ecosystem design is, I think, an important piece of educating people about how nature and play are so crucial for our children. Um, the whimsy of childhood can be a good perspective shift for adults. We sometimes get stuck thinking inside the box. So thank you for sharing with us today. Our pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today and asking questions. Um, Join us on Wednesday, April 15th at 12.30 p.m. to hear from Luis Alberto Suarez Correa and his webinar about the development of green infrastructure in Latin America, specifically looking at Colombia.